Well, folks, welcome. I'll introduce myself, Ray Ledgerwood. I work for the Washington State Conservation Commission. Um, this will be uh, one of the last uh, uh, orientations I do for employees and supervisors of a conservation district. Uh, by way of background, I've been with the conservation district movement since 1979. So never do math in public, but that's a lot of years. And uh, given that we've been uh, um, conservation district since 1939, then I've been with the organization about half of the lifetime of the conservation district. So uh, what I can tell you is you're welcome to any of the things that I may have uh, to offer in regards to experiences. And I asked some of you to write down the top two questions that you want answered about a conservation district, and that will really help us uh, drive the program to the end. I'd rather respond to some some questions and whatnot as we go along. So if you've got a question at any time, please just stop me, and, uh, and we'll make sure that we pick up those questions. So what, what I'm here to do then is uh, provide, we have one and only one objective, and that's to provide you the best information I can in regards to conservation districts, how they reform, what they do, the powers and authorities of conservation districts and supervisors throughout the state of Washington. And so one of the first questions I'd love to ask supervisors, and I have one in the room today, and I'd just like to ask her what she would really like to accomplish as a district supervisor. So, Cheryl, sure, something you'd like to accomplish as a supervisor? Well, oh, I don't know how to, I don't, well, hmm. you put me on the spot today. <laughs> right off the bat. Yeah. So, the, we'll go this way. The reason why I was interested in becoming a supervisor is because I wanted to participate mm -hmm. In the conservation movement and what's happening with it, because I think it's it's a really important and vital part of what we do here in this county, especially. And so, anything that I can contribute, you know, with the skills that I have, that's what I'd like to do is to help, you know, the conservation move along and down the path. Wow, sure. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, Jennifer, what is the one thing you always wanted to accomplish as a district? <laughs> now we can call you district director, right? Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's correct. Um, well, I've always had a uh, passion for public service mm -hmm. and for natural resources conservation. And yeah. so working in this capacity at a district brings those two things together. Um, and I just love partnership building and so being able to work with local, statewide, federal partners to advance conservation. That's what it's all about for me. So. One thing, Nick, you've always wanted to do as an employee of the conservation district. Uh, one thing I've always wanted to do. Well, yeah. I mean, always wanted to do. I like working with data a lot. Like that's mm -hmm. I'm really have data mindset. So I, I like using my skills and like my knowledge about data and you know utilizing it to help you know show the efforts that conservation districts do. So working on the back side of it. So I guess yeah, working on the. Side of things for a conservation district is something yes. I've always wanted to do. Yes. So, yeah. Oh, and you've only been with us just uh, maybe even a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> but as you came as you came to us, yeah. What what is something that you would like to get done in your work in well, conservation district? I just like being part of the, the movement, like Cheryl was saying, just being part of something so important mm -hmm. and you work, you have to have a job, but I love the idea of having a job that's also a part of something that's so important to me. Right. So just that general idea is really important and near and dear to my heart so that I could, if I can work and do something good, it, it makes me feel really good to combine those two. Um, where you said you're more on the data side, I'm more on the people side. <laughs> um, I like data too, but but I, I'm looking forward to just working with people and working with Jennifer to make, make everything better, people-wise. That's kind of my goal is taking the people, and this is such an amazing group of people, and just helping to make it, it good while we're accomplishing all these great goals. Okay. Yeah, I'm, you want to get there, I'm really excited to like learn about how the whole conservation district operates, and um, just like bridging the gap between landowners and conservation practices, I think is really important, and yeah, just like building the relationships with the landowners, but also using the data to, like, make sure that the conservation practices being put in place are effective and actually working. Okay. Scare? Something you like to do? Well, Elon summed it up pretty well. Um, I'm really interested in landowner connections and kind of you know, being that liaison 
between the environment and people and making sure that there's a balance of not just sustainability, but like um, a thriving system on both sides. Like you shouldn't have to sacrifice human needs and economy or well-being just to like put a river in place and vice versa. So I think that the conservation districts embody that pretty well. I recommend highly that you use this question often. If you get a brand new supervisor, you get a brand new employee, just find out what their answer to that question is. There is no wrong or right answer. There's just their answer. But what's important about us each knowing, you know, a little something about what you want to accomplish is that we can all be a part of your team to make that happen. So I've had a lot of different answers to this, uh, to this question, some of which were, I just really want to get on that board and tell the government what to do. That, that's, that's a real good thing, you know. And, and they were very sincere about it. And they were very, you know, passionate about telling the government what to do. And, and we were able to actually help them over time become an outstanding district supervisor. And they didn't have to let loose at what they wanted to do. They wanted to be involved in the program development, the policy development, that sort of thing. I also had some folks tell me that, that what they really want to accomplish is get to every meeting because they, they serve up the best fudge brownies. So yeah, <laughs> whatever it was, it was cooking up the fudge, fudge brownies. <laughs> and, and other answers that were just as simple as, you know, they just really enjoyed being a part of a group of people that cared about conservation. And so we, we get to serve, you know, whether we're paid employees or, or part of the governing board, we get to serve in these, these positions and we get to uh, extend our conservation work, you know, throughout. So this uh, is the very short version, a two-minute version of what I would bring to you in an orientation, the function of the conservation district. This function, as it goes up on the screen, you see a guy by the name of Dr. Peter Novak, who is a University of Wisconsin professor that studied all the conservation district laws across America. And he came up with this function statement in one of his speeches to take available technical, financial, and educational resources, whatever their source, focus or coordinate them to meet the needs of the local land user, for conservation of soil, water, and related natural resources. Are there words up there that kind of strike you as kind of interesting? Some words you can pick out of that function statement. Whatever their source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever their source. Isn't that interesting? Because um, I'm going to go into more detail about this in a bit, the powers of a conservation district to receive funding or to and make agreements for people and resources of all different shapes and sizes and equipment. But truly, Peter, when he studied the conservation districts across America, the laws that established them, he could find that in all those laws. You know, find financial, technical, educational resources, whatever their source focused them. Are there words that kind of pop out at you? That are kind of interesting there about that statement? I like to coordinate work, that yeah. word. You know, I always think about putting out a buffet table yeah. of resources and letting uh -huh. the, that local land user, I like that terminology, not just the yeah. landowner or the, the yeah. VC, pick and choose what works for them and their conservation goals. Like right. Just facilitating that for them. That coordination. Mm -hmm. I was giving a talk the other day, and I think one of the things that we're really going to be able to do in the future is really conduct forums with our landowners and land managers and have them come up with ideas. One of my favorite ones was a December meeting where we had about 25 landowners. We asked them, what, what would a buffer program look like in a Palouse? And, and they to the table. They had three tables going at the same time, and to the table they came up with this great idea of just taking uh, whatever it is and making them whole for the revenue they would have got from the commodity they would have raised that year at that market price. And now we've got a commodity buffer program. Commodity buffer program. And I think, you know, that was two years, you know, when the meeting happened, and it took about, you know, 18 months mm -hmm. or so to actually get it on the ground. And we had a lot of agency folks tell us they just didn't have anything like mm -hmm. that, you know. And so we had to kind of build it. But I think that's the key is going to be us, the conservation district sponsoring forums and opportunities for people to talk with us about what their needs are and then delivering on those. That's just going to be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As you develop your long-range plan, too, you know, you'll be able to do that, conduct forums, public outreach, that sort of thing. Any other words up there that just kind of strike you as, wow, that's, that's pretty enlightening. My favorite right here, this phrase, meets the needs of a local land user. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's okay to be parochial about mm -hmm. your conservation district and your land users in your conservation district. Because if you go to San Juan Islands, right, they're going to have a different <coughs> set of needs than they have here in the Palouse. You go up to Ferry County or Stevens County, they're going to have a different set of needs than they have in, in even the Okanagan or down south, you know, in the southeast Blue Mountain area. 
e each one of our districts, 45 of them across the state, 39 counties, gets to put together their own unique program. I, I like to tease the, uh, our district folks and say you're regularly independent, mm -hmm. regularly independent from one another, you know, and you, that's with purpose, so that you can do this the best you can. So, offered, and when I worked for the National Association of Conservation Districts uh, for 13 years, we would offer this as the rubric, right? This was, this was not only our orientation, but this is how you would evaluate how your work of your conservation district is actually doing, right? Are we doing that? Are we doing this well? If we're doing it really well, then we say we probably have a really good conservation district, good board, good staff, good everything that's working well together. All right, a little bit about history. I'll stop there and hit a pause button if there's any questions about that function statement. Dr. Peter Novak, University of Wisconsin. Any questions about that one? About this one? Yeah. All right, so far? Okay, let's go into some history. Uh, there was erosion, there was problems in natural resources, water quality issues, endangered species, problems, and that sort of thing, much before the Dust Bowl era. I don't know whether you knew that or not, I don't know that's a flash of knowledge for you, but they, we had a lot of the natural resource issues. But truly the dust storms and the, the uh, Dust Bowl, the 1930s Dust Bowl, brought attention to this serious uh, erosion problem. We broke out lands that had not been broken out, we farmed them, and we hit some really serious drought years right in the middle part of our nation. And it was really horrible. And you see these horror uh, pictures, you know, in front of you, these uh, awful pictures of some of the impacts of the soil erosion that uh, was occurring and wind erosion. Uh, steps up a person by the name of Hugh Hammond Bennett. And Hugh Hammond Bennett was known not only to be, you know, kind of the originator or founder of the Soil Conservation Service, but he was also uh, really active and involved in the formation of conservation districts. And so that, that gets less uh, attention in the history books, but Hugh Hammond Bennett, this fellow, was really heavily involved. And one of the things that Hugh Hammond Bennett did, and, and this is renowned in the historical documents of the Soil Conservation Service, uh, was that he, he was at a congressional hearing and he was trying to convince Congress, that particular committee, to form a, a, a erosion-centric agency within the federal government so that we could deal with the Dust Bowl uh, items that were going on. So he was really pushing hard for a conservation organization within the, the federal government. And the congressional hearing that he was at, he was getting telegraphs from across the, the nation, the Midwest of the nation, they were telegraphed, and saying that the dust was blowing towards Washington, D.C. He was able to keep that congressional hearing long enough, going long enough, where he could walk the members of Congress and their staff over to the window and actually see dust blowing in from Texas. Oklahoma, Kansas, and the midsection of our United States, all the way to Washington, D.C. And so he drove home with his point, right? With the need for some sort of agency to be formed because you know, there was actually that dust that was such a menace, a menace to our national welfare. So he was pressing that point with Congress and, and really uh, made the point well because uh, in 33, then the Soil Erosion Service was formed. Now this soil erosion service actually was in the Department of Interior, and if you're familiar with the Department of Interior, that's where parks and Bureau of Land Management and um, those, those types of agencies are, are formed and still reside today. Now, there was a lot of uh, administration sites that were put together, you know, by the Department of Interior, soil erosion service, federal agents went out and worked with farmers and ranchers and landowners, and they started doing conservation work. And that kind of led to some competition that went on. The competition was between uh, uh, not only the Department of Interior, but the Department of Agriculture stepped up and said, wait, these are farmers, these are ranchers, these are the people we deal with. So we should be the ones that, to lead this uh, erosion service, right, or conservation service. And then Extension stepped up and they said, look, well, we're the researchers, and we're going to have the information, the science, and the research needed for the, uh, to stop this, so this serious soil erosion that was occurring. So they struggled back and forth, and finally, uh, uh, after some struggling, then the soil Conservation Service, SCS it was known then, uh, was created in 1935 under that public law, Public Law 46. Real good, real good piece of information to Google if you wanted to, Public Law 46, go ahead and find out why, why this agency was formed, what it was formed to do, that sort of thing. It's just extremely interesting, extremely interesting. I have about three documents that I want you to write down. That would be one of them. I would go look at that. Certainly I would go and look at um, The Worst of Times by Timothy Egan. The worst, oh, the worst times, yeah. The worst, times, the worst hard yeah. times, or something like that. I think. Yeah, it's the worst book. hard times. Huh? That's a great book. It's a great book. 
And it does go into, you know, the formation of this, mm -hmm. a little bit of this history I'm giving you today, but it also talks about the conservation districts. Through the eyes of the people that actually lived through those horrendous events, the dust storms that were actually happening, some of the family members, you know, and, and passed along the stories and whatnot. And so uh, it's the worst hard time. Is that yeah, the worst hard time? Yeah, by Timothy Egan. You know, so that's a good one. Uh, For the Love of the Lamb is another book I want to uh, introduce to you. For the Love of the Lamb was written by Neil Sampson. Neil Sampson was our executive director of the National Association of Conservation Districts for several years. He was Idaho born. Some of you in the room are Idaho residents. So um, he was Idaho born, Neil Sampson, For the Love of the Lamb, and it's all about the formation of conservation districts in America. How we came about, and just a little bit as the story goes along here, I'm going to tell you about how we came about. But uh, that's that's a good one too. If you like Forest Service or Forest Lands, um, The Big Burn by Timothy Egan. <laughs> the Big Burn. I uh, read that one too. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that some kind of book? Just, and it yeah. gives you a, a sense of our yeah. Kellogg, Idaho area yeah. and, and the horrible burn that occurred there and yeah. the Forest Service erupting, you might say, out of that need for for protecting uh, those beautiful resources, our forest land resources on public lands in particular, but you know, also uh, working in the environment. So, three pretty good books to grab. Uh, now you got electronic books you can get instead of having to have the real hard copy. I used to pack the hard copies around with these things all the time, but I don't do that anymore. All right, so we have the Soil Conservation Service, formed in 35. It's now the Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, otherwise known as NRCS then. And you'll, you'll hear me talk about NRCS quite often during the course of this uh, event today. Well, 75 years now, it's about 80 years or so because uh, 39 or so is when we formed our conservation districts here in Washington State, and more about that in just a bit. So we've been at this for about 80 years, partnership with conservation districts across the nation, and it was the Soil Conservation Service and NRCS. So okay, here's a trivia question, and, and if you've been reading about uh, conservation districts, you know where the first one was formed? I would assume somewhere in the Midwest. You would, wouldn't you? That makes so much sense. It's like, okay, yeah, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, someplace like that. No? no. Anybody else, I guess? Yeah. Well, come, drive the peg there, because when you come back to, you said the Plouffe Conservation District, and, and yeah, that's coming up. Um, uh, in fact, uh, just a bit. the Sierras or something? Yeah, it's really crazy. It was Brown Creek, Soil and Water Conservation North District Carolina. in North Carolina. Yeah. In North Carolina, uh, Actually, as the story goes, I'm not so sure that Hugh Hammond Bennett didn't have some North Carolina roots, so he might have put mm -hmm. in a few markers there to make that happen. We'll have to check the history books to see if that's actually true or not. But the Brown Creek Soil Water Conservation District in North Carolina, they love to celebrate their first, being the first soil conservation district in America. But you're, you're right, Cheryl. <laughs> it's the North Palouse, if I remember right, the North Palouse Conservation District was the first form in our state. And so, as, as the story goes on here, the Conservation Service sent federal agents out, they work with land managers, they work with landowners, and they really, what kind of response do you think they were getting from the landowners and the people in the 1930s? Federal agents Probably not welcoming them with open arms. Not that, yeah. There was, there was, of course, you know, exceptions to that. There were some people that really welcomed them, and most of them were pretty apprehensive about a federal agent out on their place telling them what they do. And so the idea by Hugh Hammond Bennett and his buddies was to actually put together a model of conservation district law where you would form local boards. And these local boards would give the guidance and direction and prioritization to conservation work that would happen in their local communities. And so the, the cool thing about this is the model of conservation district law was, was sent out to every state legislature, right? Every state legislature across the country and were asked to form conservation districts. They didn't have to just use just the model law, they could amend it. And the point I want to make here is if you do move to Idaho, their law is different than the conservation district law here in Washington State. The one in North Carolina is different than the one here in Washington State. The one in uh, Northern Mariana Islands is different than the one in Washington State and the one in America. And Samoa, where I got to help form the conservation district, is a different conservation district law completely too. So just because you do work here in Washington State, we're going to have you be familiar with our Washington State law, of course, but we would make sure that if you move somewhere else, that you get familiar with that conservation district law there. Is so, there a yeah. district in Lathop County? I haven't yep. looked at that oh, specifically yeah. for Lathop. Yeah. I haven't researched them at all, but I was assuming there's that. That's right. That's so Soil curious. Water Conservation District mm -hmm. with Kim mm -hmm. as our manager. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been with them for a lot of years, and their board is just phenomenal, too. Oh, that's great. 
crazy this year. It's a great program. That's yeah. awesome. Big planting crew, if Such I remember right. Big shield crew. And, yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. awesome. Really active board yeah. and associate member board members. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Get staff. Them. I haven't looked yet. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Is that one of your questions? Did we cover one of your questions? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, and I just because I live in that county and we bought land and yeah. recently out in the county oh, and yeah. I just um, it'd be neat so to figure out that. Yeah, or go yeah. to their meeting and yeah. check, out, check it out. Just see, what see. they're so close to us, also. You know. Yeah. yeah. So two thousand nine hundred and forty-three, give or take, in a given day of the month or, or day of the week, <laughs> conservation districts across the nation. So that that follows suit with <coughs> something that we do want to talk about. Two thousand nine hundred and forty-three soil and water conservation districts, known as conservation districts, soil and water conservation districts, <coughs> soil conservation districts, mm -hmm. resource conservation districts. The one thing that's different about each state law is they can re, they can name actually the conservation district to match what it is that they felt like in their state. So you'll see all those names show up. You'll see conservation district officials like Cheryl are called conservation district supervisors here within our, our state, but they're called directors in other states, like California, and mm -hmm. some commissioners in, in uh, Arkansas, if I remember correctly, or Alabama. And, and so the terminology kind of goes with the law and how the law was changed in each state. How am I doing so far? Good pace? Is that right? Oh, yeah. Not too fast, awesome. not too slow? Okay, so this RCW stands for Revised Code of Washington, so you'll see that come up quite a bit as an acronym, Revised Code of Washington 8908. And we're going to delve into it a little bit deeper and talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But it authorized the formation of our conservation districts here in Washington State and the State Conservation Commission, the organization that I work for. Very small agency, has 10 members on its board. We're blessed to have uh, Larry Cochran, who is the chair of our conservation district here in Palouse District, also be a commission member. So one of only 10 statewide uh, board members uh, that we have. Uh, that actually look at you know the conservation district's needs here, help develop budgets, appoint two people to the conservation district in each of our 45 uh, conservation districts. So we're formed, our little agency is one of six in the nation that actually is formed like the model law originated at four, which was to be only about conservation district work. So a, a very small agency, but there are only six left in the nation. The rest of them have been absorbed by the Department of Agriculture or by Department of Environmental Qualities in their state or Department of Public Lands in their state, and we've not been absorbed. We're relatively small, but we're, we're just one focus. We wake up in the day, we wake up in the morning, and all we talk about, think about on our work days is conservation districts. Sometimes <coughs> even past our work days. <laughs> and we are so lucky to have a standalone conservation commission yeah. um, that really prides themselves on dedication to the districts and has a really intimate relationship where we can pick up the phone and talk to somebody who knows us mm -hmm. and is there to help all the time. Yeah. So it's really an amazing relationship and the service yeah. that the you know, take a lot of pride in that, but you can call us and you can mm -hmm. talk with us about conservation district things mm -hmm. and needs and you don't have to spend the first 15 minutes describing what you are. Mm -hmm. In terms of state government mm -hmm. and where you fit mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, we don't know all that already. We just we just need to go to work for you. So this relationship uh, since 1939, then that small state agency I was just talking about, the Conservation Commission, provides direct services for conservation districts. We appoint two supervisors to each of the conservation district boards. Cheryl is one of those here, mm -hmm. and she went through, I, I hope, a pleasant uh, mm -hmm. interview process yeah. where the yeah. committee commission members actually talked with you, <laughs> and I got a chance to talk with you. It was kind of kind of like well the home week because Perry Beal was one of the interviewees, <laughs> and he said Zacharias and I used to show bulls against Zacharias down in Lewiston at the Lewiston Hereford show, <laughs> and so uh, the thing that we recognize pretty quickly is in agriculture, natural resources, and conservation districts we are very much interconnected, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of heritage that goes mm -hmm. along with uh, some of that. So. Uh, uh -huh. Uh, Cheryl's in-laws, you know, been heavily involved in, in that for some time. So Perry picked up on that very quickly, didn't yeah. they? <laughs> yeah, I hope it made you feel right at home. So like, Geez, okay, I'm talking to a friend of, of my in-laws. We compile a biannual budget request of the conservation districts throughout the state, and we put that together, and we send it to the governor, and then on to the legislature. Pretty successful this year in at least maintaining what we have and getting slight gains in what we have had in the past. And um, we monitor the accountability of districts in compliance with state and federal laws. I'm here to report to you that at least every conservation district filed their annual plan of work on time this year. 
every conservation district, I didn't know this last night, but every conservation district filed their state audit reports all on time this year. So we always take a lot of pride in that when that happens. And we go to the state legislature, the governor's office, and actually say on these 15 compliance items, right, we must do that are in state law that we have complied, you know, X amount of our districts have complied with this and that and the other. So pretty active involved in that. All right, stop the history for just a bit, hit a pause button. Did you have questions around the history, purpose, early days of the conservation district movement? I've got some questions. Yeah, I'm sorry. I can tell you, you got, you're in for a real treat because the law that was written, the revised code of Washington 8908, is just power packed with authorities and abilities to do a lot of cool things. And so often uh, uh, I reflect on it and think, you know, over the years I've not seen, you know, probably the full extent of what the authorities can be used for. Just kind of seeing, you know, bits and pieces of it along the way. Nothing on the history, huh? Know who you am and then it is? But if I had a little mini test with you, know, the kind of things that he's going to. There were others involved other than you haven't been it, but he was really a spokesperson, an outspoken person, you know, about the need for, first of all, erosion, uh, you know, an agency within the federal government. And then he came back around and said, whoa, that's not good enough. We have local people involved in this, or it's just not going to work well. And so that's that's what first does. Now, that would conclude my orientation that I would have if you wanted a really, really short version. But I would go a little bit deeper in this. And I think we should. Well, I'm going to point out first that, that conservation districts are real government all the time. So they are a political subdivision in the state of Washington. So when I go on airplane trips, you know, and, and work in other conservation districts in other states, and I really enjoy doing that, worked in all 50 states, done thousands of workshops of different shapes and sizes, and especially when I was with the National Association of Conservation Districts. I logged right at, uh, I think I'm at 1,500,000 miles in air miles. You know, today, you know, and all the travels, some nationwide and some just back and forth across the state. But this is important because when you're sitting there on an airplane and somebody asks you what to do for a living, I packed two cards with me. One was my business card, of course, and then another card function in the conservation district, a little bit about conservation districts on the back of it. And I'll make sure that you've got uh, some of those. I, I thought I had some in my car, but I didn't. So um, I would point out when people would look at me with a quizzical look, I'd say I work with conservation districts, and they, mm, I'm not quite sure what that is. I'd say, do you know what a school board is? Oh, yes, you know, so-and-so, and so-and-so, -and, -so, and my aunt, my cousin, and some that serves on a school board. Great. Think of a school board as to education, like a conservation district is to natural resources conservation. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's one of those in our county? I said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Probably one in every county across the nation. You know, 2,943 of them. Out across the nation, working on conservation needs, right, and pointing out as a board of directors or supervisors what it is that's needed and hiring staff and doing that sort of thing. And it, it just clicks in. For whatever reason, that little bit of an analogy just, just you know, strikes a note. So school board, except for conservation districts, for conservation, like school board is education. Well, I've mentioned this, uh, this piece of legislation. I do suggest that you go in and read it all. Uh, it's not necessarily, I'm quite sure I haven't talked to you the other day, some of our videos and things are a little bit dry. This might be a little bit dry too, Cheryl, just to kind of warn you. Oh, but the first, the preamble that formed the conservation districts, what we were formed for and whatnot, is anything but dry. And the powers, duties, and authorities is really awesome to talk about. So local governance provided by a five-member board of supervisors. So we call them supervisors here in Washington State. And then the supervisors are being ultimately responsible for the operations of the district. So we can hire people, we can give them duties, we can delegate authorities, but when it all comes down to it, if it all kind of fell apart, it would be the conservation district supervisors who are ultimately responsible for making sure that that doesn't happen. And I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon here in the police conservation district. So here we go, 8908. Uh, and the conservation district organized provisions, the act of this uh, act shall constitute a government subdivision, again, of the state, public body, corporate, and politic, Exercising public powers. Supervisors will have the following powers. And then the piece that I didn't put in here, but a slide that probably should, would be next, would be one that would talk about, you know, why we're, uh, why we're actually formed in the first place to take care of floods, serious erosion issues, um, water uh, supply issues, and that sort of thing. And it goes into a nice set of, um, you know, information about how, how and why we were formed. Okay. All right. Let's start out with the powers, duties, and authorities. And purposely, uh, 
I don't have many of these, so I'm going to pass these around, right? Okay? And then we're going to, yeah, here we go. <laughs> we can share a little bit. I'm going to use this one. My well reference. This looks good. It's Look at broken. this. This is really broken. <laughs> All right, so if you turn to the page, uh, page, page, pages, and we're going to go right down here to page uh, probably 10, and we're going to start with that. That's good. I like to see that. <laughs> Let's see marks or highlight pen marks. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really nice one feel good. Um, the, uh, the first item that a supervisor can do is employ people. And for my employees in the room, this is kind of cool, right? But then you determine the qualifications, duties, and compensation of these people. Now remember, there's 45 of these conservation districts in our state alone, right? Each one of them can put together their own compensation package. So we don't have one particular you know, rate schedule or anything like that unless it's done by the local district. So this district could be paying people and compensating and, and having different job duties and that sort of thing for different people than the neighboring district and certainly the neighboring neighboring district. It's all ruggedly independent from one another, so that they get to make choices about the way that they're going to hire people, who they're going to hire, how they're going to compensate. And just a, a struck comparison, if I might, just one district over, we have a district with only two-thirds of an employee. That's it. Not even one position. Got five projects done this year. One position took care of management duties, took care of a lot of different things, you know, as one person working with the, his board, you know, to get things done. Much smaller scale program that you see here in the Palouse Conservation District or our larger districts, but still a very, very good active program. And so know that there's everything in between, right? From two-thirds of an employee to, how many are you at now, 20-some? Um, well, with AmeriCorps we're at 23. 23 with staff, AmeriCorps. Staff? 18. 18. Mm -hmm. So one of our larger districts in Eastern Washington, yeah, probably the next largest here in Eastern Washington would be Spokane Conservation District, and they've been large for some time. So, all right, lot lot of districts have four or five staff. You know, is kind of a norm. You know, for about 30, 30 or so of our districts in Washington State. All right, determine qualifications and authorities and compensation. They can delegate authorities. These are supervisor powers now. They can delegate authorities to that, and they do that very clearly to Jennifer as our mm -hmm. district director, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, Jennifer to you all, the, the, our staff in the, in the district. We can get legal services. Kind of an interesting thing about conservation districts, the supervisors can call upon uh, their own legal services. They can call upon the uh, services of a risk management agency called Enduris, E-N-D-U-R-I-S, uh, for help when it comes to questions around the human resources and other questions around liability and, and errors and omissions and things like that. Cheryl asked yesterday, do we have coverage? And yes, we do. And it's a premium that we pay to that risk management agency. Now, when things get a little bit tougher in terms of questions needing answered and whatnot, then Enduris turns to the, an organization called the Municipal Research Service Corporation. Municipal Research Service Corporation. So otherwise known as MRSC, I'm doing well on the acronyms, aren't I? I'm trying not to use them. Yeah, I'm really trying not to use them. I used to tease people. I'd say, I'd pay you a buck for every acronym I do during the next course of the two hours, and then it just about broke me, so I had to stop doing that. It really stops you from using acronyms if you think about it. You know, get your wallet out and start pissing dollars out there on the table. All right, Municipal Research Service Corporation would be who Enduris would call. That actually is a composite group of lawyers that helps government entities here in the state of Washington do their work. So the cities and the counties and other people can call on MRSC for their activities. And they have great websites with great pieces of information regarding the operations of a government entity. So I highly encourage you to kind of cruise that MRSC website, Enduris's website. Enduris <laughs> has trainings, MRSC has trainings, Conservation Commission has trainings. We have trainings. <laughs> and so many different topics, you know, it's, it's just great. Now, you can hire your own legal services you want to. And some districts do have a lawyer on retainer. <coughs> now, it gets really big and it, it affects all the conservation districts in the state of Washington. You can call upon, the district can call upon the state's attorney general for their, for their help. And we do that from time to time. But usually we reserve that through the commission for something that really impacts all the conservation districts. Uh, recently when we had a, a state audit report that said that, for several districts, that said that 
we couldn't have interlocal agreements to share engineering services. We thought, well, that's odd. We can have that. It says right in the law we can have that. And the state's attorney general actually helped us work through the piece of legislation that would clarify them. You know, so things like that where it gets to that state level, we, we hire them. So legal services, supervisors can have. We ask that the supervisors furnish the commission with various things, annual reports, contracts, bids, things like that, upon request. Uh, the annual reports and long-range plans and an annual plans are all part of what we ask for as part of that conservation accountability performance program called CAP. All right. We also, uh, at Power Studies and Authorities of Supervisor, includes that we would have a surety bonds for everyone to handle this money. So uh, we were talking about this last night at our meeting, and, and the board members that handle money would be covered under our surety bond. The treasurer, uh, Jennifer, if she's going to be signing checks, would be covered under the surety bond. Our finance people that handle monies uh, under the surety bond. Yeah. All right. This also provides for the full and accurate proceedings, you know, of, of our work that we do. The supervisor is responsible for that. You can invite a legislative body to come and participate in our meetings. The supervisors can, and it speaks specifically, if I remember right, to cities, county officials, county executives, things like that, which is kind of a nice. Nice piece of work to be able to know that it was expected in 1939 that we would actually be inviting a legislative body, city, municipality, county, near or within the district, to designate a representative to advise and consult with it on all the questions and program policy that affect property, water supply, other interests of the municipality or county. So you kind of wonder, this is one of these kind of un unrealized pieces of authority, right? You think, dang. You know, we should be doing that. We should have somebody from the city of Pullman. Actually, we do, but, you know, he's got a different hat when he comes here. Uh, the various cities uh, and, and throughout our district, or maybe even the county, should come. We, there was once upon a time we used to have our county uh, represented with us. A county commissioner would come to every meeting. I can't remember his name now, but he was, maybe it was before you were a manager. And there's one county commissioner that was assigned to come to each one of our meetings. And I thought that was very strong. That allowed us to have good conversations about what's going on in our county, especially around roadways and sedimentation along roadways and, you know, serious erosion problems, things like that. So I, I highly encourage you to do that and invite a legislative body. Another one of the supervisor's powers would be to have advisory committees. And this speaks to some of the uh, committees that you actually formed, you know, and actually help with um, committees informed of its work. Advisory committees shall submit recommendations from time to time. Um, you know, as was pointed out, Jennifer is very, very good about bringing partnerships together. And for our regional conservation partnership, we had partnerships brought together. But before that, you actually had a team of folks, a partnership. What was that Conservation called? Forum. Conservation mm -hmm. Forum. Mm -hmm. We would invite anybody um, locally to come in and talk about what they're doing for their conservation programs and try to identify gaps and ways that we could work together and have efficiencies. And that could be anything from uh, local student group on campus to uh, city folks, schools, um, other state government, federal agencies as well. So. We know we can't do this alone and why should we, right? Mm -hmm. There are other organizations out there interested in conservation, in agriculture, and things that go on within our communities. And so, again, I thought, I think that was a big part of why you, it was easy to go to the Regional Conservation Partnership uh, mm -hmm. program proposal and things mm -hmm. like that as you had already built that structure. And you see that structure working well. We see another one uh, like that in Walla Walla. Mm -hmm. Seems to be working well, and some of the other districts have been there. Advisory committees. So you can actually form committees as a conservation district to advise you on certain things. So if you wanted to get into small acreage, you know, situations here in Palouse mm -hmm. District, uh, highly recommend that you would form an advisory committee that would sit off to the side, do the work, bring your ideas, bring your recommendations, and help us uh, figure this out. That's what I was jabbering about when it came to forums, right? that the landowners themselves, such sharp people, such talented, knowledgeable, experienced people, ask them. Ask them to come together and figure out, you know, what kind of program we should be delivering and then uh, help them, you know, with finding ways to deliver that. It'd be kind of fun. Mm -hmm. So you can advance way beyond just the five district supervisors and their associates, which are non-voting, non-government, you know, part of, uh, you know, our structure, <coughs> to staff, to these advisory committees that could operate if you wanted to. A few of them, but not a lot of them, right? Uh, in our district. Do I miss any communities? Not really? Okay. Okay. 
Hit a pause button. These are powers of conservation district supervisors included in the state law. And the, and the section, if you ever want to go to it, is section 210. So uh, it's, it's a popular one for us to look at regularly and say, okay, you can be sitting in there in the middle of the night, 10 o'clock at night, all of a sudden the supervisors will erupt into a question, Jennifer, can we do this? Mm -hmm. And usually the answer is in the state law, 210 or 220, section 210 or 220. So committing that to memory is pretty important. I'm going to send you, we're going to send a little email um, network sign-up sheet around to you mm -hmm. so I can send you actually a, a brief version of the powers and the authorities mm -hmm. of supervisors and, and districts. And I can send you an electronic version of this little handbook. Oh, cool, you already got it. Sweet. And, uh, you know, and, and I'll send you some other things, especially you, Cheryl. I've got some other things to send you around. Probably not gotten to you. All right. Pause button. How are we doing so far? Give me a couple questions now. I would stop right here and just take a couple questions. Something you always want to know about districts. Would you write down earlier? Yeah. So with this law, if I can go back, um, yeah. have, have there been rulings over time with the AGs when there have been questions about, mm -hmm. okay, what, ex what, you know, when questions have come up about what our authorities are within the RCW, right. are there a right. body of rulings and opinions mm -hmm. from the AG? The annotated version, yeah, there's an annotated version that would have, you know, this was uh, answered in this way at this time. Mm -hmm. There's also the amendments that have been because there's been a few amendments that have been made over the over time. And they're in the RCWs? I'll have to search that out for you. Yeah, but I think they are in the RCWs. There's footnotes in the uh, website version mm -hmm. of the Secretary of State. When you go to that one, I think it's got the annotated versions, and this was amended in this date and that date, and, and this was challenged on this date or that date. And if it's not there, then uh, they're going to lose one of their historians here pretty soon. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we can find the answer usually for you within the staff. There's usually a record of that. Yeah, that's a lot of good memories. Good question. Yeah. There's been some challenges. Uh, I would say none of them have been, you know, overturned to the law. The law is mm -hmm. so clear. Mm -hmm. When you actually read some of this, the language is so clear, and I'll point some of that out here in the district powers there. Mm -hmm. More questions? Thanks. Sure. So, would you say from state to state that the powers and duties of supervisors are relatively similar, or mm -hmm. are there areas where there's a lot of variance? Relatively similar. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the biggest difference, Caitlin, has to be in the area of funding. Because the law that was sent out, the model law, was really silent on funding sources. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't describe that mm -hmm. it would be a taxing authority, they didn't just prescribe that it would be an assessment authority. They didn't put a funding mm -hmm. system together. So every state law is different in regards to how districts are funded, if there's anything in their state law about funding in districts. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest differences. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the, these powers and authorities, very similar. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that because I have the opportunity mm -hmm. to go out and actually do the workshops across the nation. And I'd study their powers and authorities, their version, right? Mm -hmm. And then put it up on the screen so that we would talk about it about, you know, what it is, powers and authorities they have. But this is very similar, the supervisors. Mm -hmm. And some of these ones, I'll, I'm glad you asked that question now because when I drive to, through the district powers, I want to stop every once in a while and point out some of the differences that we've seen across the nation. Mm -hmm. and, and there are some differences, but they're pretty subtle. Yeah. But yeah, great question. Yeah. So, to kind of piggyback on that, you were talking about funding, unless you're going to go over it later. I can go over it later. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but go ahead with your question. You just had mentioned on a previous slide that most of the funding was through the legislature. Yes. And they yes. have to like put, I guess, like a bill or a grant for a, something right. forward. Right. So, and I assume they're state funded because each conservation district is uh -huh. state independent. Uh -huh. But are there federal grants that fund conservation districts or get uh -huh. funneled into them? Or do they also take like private grants and donations from other yeah. larger entities and companies or personnel? The good news is it's all the above. Isn't that cool? It could be a local source of government funding or non-government funding. It could be a, you know, a, an organization that wanted to fund the project or the district. It could be state funding. Uh, ours is through the general funding. A lot of ours is through the general funding. But we're in one district here that gets uh, grants from the Department of Ecology mm -hmm. and the Department of Fish and Wildlife, mm -hmm. right? You've got grants from the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the United States Fish and Wildlife mm -hmm. Service. 
So any of those sources, mm -hmm. that slide that said, yeah, from whatever the source is mm -hmm. really true. And we could also receive monies from the Pheasants Forever, mm -hmm. Quails Unlimited, you know, PCI. Or just like somebody's will yeah. that yeah, they decide exactly. to put it forward or something mm -hmm. like that. Exactly. And while I was going to cover this later, yeah. private foundations and whatnot, yeah. Yeah, there's a section of IRS code that's really related to funding government entities, but it's unknown. It's Section 170. So Section 170 of the IRS tax code allows a donor. So if Nick's family just decided to give over their whole farm you know, to the district, he could do that. And the, the donors would get the same tax benefit as if they give it to Bill and Melinda Gates, mm -hmm. which is really awesome. But it's a different part of the tax law. Mm -hmm. So you have to be experts on that. That's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why you came here today, was to learn about some of these nuances that you have to know about that no one else is going to know about, is that through Section 170 of the IRS tax code, we can receive contributions and gifts and this and that and the other. But in our state law for foreign conservation districts, I'll come up on a, on a section that says, and the district can receive donations of this and that and the other, or do grants or agreements with government and non-government. Okay. To follow up on that, if somebody had given the conservation district land, mm -hmm. um, does the conservation district have to use it I guess like within the family, like how it was meant to be used, yeah. like maybe farmland, or yeah. could it be turned into like an easement? Well certainly there are restrictions on fee title that could come over from a donor, right? Mm -hmm. They could tell you that it'll always be in this, this particular way. Uh, absent of that, then they wouldn't have to do anything more than the pursued conservation work. It says you can receive these things to do the work of the conservation district. Mm -hmm. So there would be unlimited what they could do. However, most, I think most donors would say it has to be used in this use, yeah. it has to be done for this, and perpetuity, that sort of thing. Those are very common. Uh, easements are also an interesting thing because conservation districts can hold easements. Mm -hmm. So let's just say that I had a ranch out here somewhere and I wanted to make sure that it was always going to be a ranch. You could hold that easement for our family. I would, our family would still own the land, but we'd give you yeah. just that part of the easement that says it's always going to be in agriculture and conservation. Mm -hmm. We saw that the other day at Tom Camerzell's place, Maple Cave Farms, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Where he had arranged for certain uh, easement rights to go over to a place so that it will always be in farmland. It won't be taken over by the houses and so forth. Mm -hmm. Urban sectors. It's pretty common. We don't want to get in the way of the Palouse Land Trust or Land Trust or other that are in the business of doing this easements, but sometimes you just get a person that wants to come in and they just like the conservation district. Mm -hmm. Like a donor in the, the the wine country of California, Napa Valley. And I haven't been up on their website recently, but as the story goes, there was a donor that wanted to donate this vineyard to the local conservation district, the Napa oh. Resource mm -hmm. Conservation mm -hmm. District. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the donation was for a vineyard. It wasn't a large vineyard, but it was a vineyard with a home place, right? Mm -hmm. the, the His family's home place, their house, and their vineyard was donated to the Napa Resource Conservation District. They made their office the farm house when this was done. The fields became demonstration sites, right? For irrigation water management. The working vineyard, the working vineyard. So some of their staff had the conservation demonstration project. They had to take care of the business. I like it. Exactly. And of course, the proceeds from the sale of the grapes. I mean, they didn't make wine there, but they sold it to winemakers. The, the proceeds from the sale of the grapes went on to do more conservation work and to run your business. You know, what a wonderful kind of circle of, of good things that went on there. And it was all due to the California state law allowed that to happen. Our Washington state law mirrors that. So back to your original question, there's a lot of changes, but there are, uh, excuse me, there's a lot of similarity, but there are some slight revisions. Uh, enough where, as a national guy, I had to make sure I knew what I was talking about when I got up on the podium. <laughs> to speak yeah. <laughs> to that audience about their law. Because if you bring a, a Washington State example in the, that world when it didn't fit, that wasn't very good. But the Napa one's pretty consistent with the you know, donations and so forth. You know. Pickup trucks, computers, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe a, maybe a computer system <laughs> needs to be donated instead of having to pay for it, you know, the one that you what you're bored of really, you're bored of jump for joy if you came in, hey, we got it donated, guys, you know, isn't this great, um, we won't have to use that money from that you, that you uh, approved the other night, because we're just going to, yeah. I was just wondering, um, about the private donations mm -hmm. for yeah. this district, mm -hmm. what, like, percentage-wise, and I, I assume oh, it's overwhelmingly 
public, but do we get substantial private? We have not developed that um, very much in the past. So part of um, bringing on the grants and development position, which is still a new position, was to um, once things get settled out on the grant management side, use that time, Jessica's time, to go out and develop more info, yeah, funding development, whether that's development from private foundation um, sources for grants, where we've been mostly on um, state or federal funding for grants, as well as private donations, um, like right. Donate Outreach Now program. on our website, you know, oh, cool. should be coming okay. in, having those. We have a lot of um, local donations for things like our annual meeting, where we get enough local sponsorship and donations to supply a meal for folks who come and things like that. So we have in our um, annual cropping symposium, yep. a lot of local donations for that, okay. but not cool. going into our general operating. So it's kind of a future mm -hmm. yeah, it's outreach there. project. So the oh, GoFundMe sites, you. things like that, yeah, to that. restore yeah. this hunk of uh, the Fluce River or something might be kind of fun. I think it's that third leg of stool we need to get so we have more stability so we get state, federal, and private funding. So I think uh, one of the examples I think where they have gained quite a bit of uh, public interest has been the Bets on the Farm mm -hmm. and the Spokane County Conservation District with their Bets on the Farm. Home Depot mm -hmm. has put in a fair amount of mm -hmm. dollars and labor and whatnot to help, you know, help with that mm -hmm. effort. And, uh, you know, that's one of the examples mm -hmm. that flashes in my mind. Several of the Puget Sound districts have developed mm -hmm. this private donation system a little bit better than, than mm -hmm. we have. But, you know, well, it's it's you. there now. Yeah, I just wasn't sure. I, I was thinking yeah. of all public and didn't think yeah. the private side, yeah. but that's... I think Big Blue really just wanted to drop a few dollars, you know, in our way, or, you know, there you something go. like that, with all your contacts. <laughs> right. <on>. Yeah. <laughs> it could be a joint project or something. <laughs> in all seriousness, though, you, you look at it in the, in the context of, why wouldn't people want to, bless you, why wouldn't people want to donate at least a few dollars to a good cause like this? And we're relatively unknown, there's an advantage to that is that we're relatively unknown. Mm -hmm. So people don't blame us for everything that goes wrong. <laughs> now when you get known, and you know, and you get in the private circle, mm -hmm. right, and, and you are receiving those, then you're gonna bring a, a lot of scrutiny with mm -hmm. it, a lot of accountability, and that's good too. Mm -hmm. And so there there will be the other side of that. So, but I think we're ready for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've been years mm -hmm. preparing and now we're ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh strange side thought. It's okay. Fire <laughs> um, go for it. I don't know how, because I just you were talking about private fun funding, and then you said not well. Anyway, um, so I just came from Fort Collins, Colorado, and so because all the conservation districts are technically like by county, or I guess ours is like a quarter of the county. Right. Um, right, right. Uh, the county in Fort Collins is Larimer County, and mm -hmm. they have a very strong feeling, positive feeling, about their conservation districts yes. and parks and yes. county stuff. Yeah. So they actually put in a county legislator that there's like a, like a percentage of a cent tax yeah. on every right. like transaction that goes right. on within the county and right. all that gets funded back into yeah. county conservation efforts Excellent. and parks Excellent. and well, conservation cool. districts. It's would that cool be part. something that would ever pass well, let's do talk about this that. In Colorado, they do have a taxing authority, so they can do that. Mm -hmm. They can actually, you know, uh, with the uh, agreement of the county government, you know, in the conservation district, they can mm -hmm. establish a county taxing authority. So that's one of the things we don't have here in Washington mm -hmm. State. In fact, in Washington State, it's very uh, specific that we cannot tax. Mm -hmm. Now, what's kind of interesting mm -hmm. about that is that we do have assessment authority, which is a little bit different than tax, although the, the result is roughly the same. So much per, uh, so many cents per acre of a cropland acre or a grazing land acre and whatnot can be approved by the county government. And then that monies can go to the conservation district. More recently though, that was uh, years past, in the mm -hmm. 80s and early 90s we had that. More recently we have something called rates and charges, mm -hmm. which is a, a, an opportunity to fund conservation districts on the county level that if there's a formula that we're going to do this type of work, whatever that might be, these types of things, at this amount of money it takes to run that program, then the county uh, government, the county commissioners working with the conservation district can actually approve that, that formula, right, and can actually make that happen within Whitman County. So, uh, yes, we've got a different system than what they have in Colorado, but we do have a way to fund called 
rates and charges. And it is a few steps that you have to go through with the county, um, county government in order to be able to get that. The one thing here in Whitman County is that we have had interest in that, but not strong enough interest to overcome the concern uh, by people about one more uh, payment on their lands, on their acreage. So that's been a tough one to overcome. However, I'll let you know that Lincoln Conservation District has had an uh, rates and charges or an assessment system for years. You know, similar type of uh, topography, similar type of people, similar type of culture, and they really have done well. That provides, and I'm glad you mentioned this, that really provides a base, base funding that you can match grants with and that sort of thing. You can always count on that amount of money coming in every year, and the controlling uh, individuals are the board members. So we don't have to worry about the grants requirements or this requirements or that requirements. The board can say, on this particular set of money for, from rates and charges from the local citizenry, we're going to do this and that and the other. So they run their own cost share program. When you say Washington doesn't have tax, is it like income tax or sales tax or? 8908, the law tax. is specific to not be able to allow taxes for conservation districts. Just assessment authority or rates and charges, no okay. taxes. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't do the same thing as they do in Colorado as well. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Colorado is just the opposite. They have the taxing authority built into their law. They have the tax for everything. You're yeah. a little bit extra for everything in Colorado. <laughs> I was just down there. They have a really strong structure of uh, watershed associations, too. That's conservation districts that work together on a watershed basis. And they have to do workshops for them. The water law in Colorado is some of like, the craziest and most intensive in the it U.S. Is. It's it is. very yeah. integrated. Yeah, they spoke about that. There. I worked with the 10 watershed associations, five in one location for two days and five in another location for mm -hmm. two days. So it was just extremely interesting, not only to prepare for it, but actually to deliver the workshop. I worked with the school too. Powers and duties of the conservation districts now. I'll move ahead a little bit, and we're going to uh, actually make mention of some of the things that you've asked mm -hmm. questions about. First thing I can tell you is that in the, in the law, it allows us to do surveys and investigations and research. But in the law, it also says do not do that in duplication of existing uh, ac activities. So to avoid duplication of research activities, no district shall initiate any research program except for the cooperation of the government of the state or uh, any of its agencies, the United States or any of its agencies. So it actually asks us to make sure that, that ag and ecology and others aren't doing that already, or Washington State University or University of Washington are already doing that so that we don't duplicate. So we can conduct surveys, investigations, and research. The Columbia Conservation District is the closest one. They're doing a lot of soils health work down there, mm -hmm. pH and that sort of thing, or liming soils, they're trying to figure out you know, what will change that uh, declining pH in our uh, eastern Washington soils, right? And get that back up again. Can we do it through crops? Can we do it through cropping rotations? Do we have to do it through lime? Do we have to do it through this and that? But the Columbia Conservation District, I'm very proud of them. They, they've had a research project every year since that moment. So they've done a wonderful job on that. You can conduct educational demonstration projects in all different shapes and sizes. And what's fun about that is that um, it, it will say these words several times in the law. Are you ready for this? To conduct educational demonstration projects on any lands. you got to be kidding me. 1930s, they really knew how to write laws. Any lands within the district. Upon obtaining the consent of the occupier of such lands, and such necessary rights or interests in the lands that may be required in order to demonstrate by example the means, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, methods, and, and so forth. Now, incorporated within our conservation district law is that terminology, with the consent of the land, I get that right? Occupier of the lands, with the consent of the occupier of the lands. So that'd be land managers, landowners, that sort of thing. Or in the case of the state of Washington lands, the Department of Natural Resources, and those, it would be with their you know, uh, consent to do things. And we can do, actually, and we don't do a lot of this, but we can do work on private lands and public lands with the consent of the land, part of the lands. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what sets us completely different. This is a key point. At 210, I've got to drive this point home, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't have a regulatory part of this law whatsoever. There is nothing regulatory about us. There is no go in and do anything unless the occupier of the land says, you're welcome on our place and can do things. Now, the popular notion by people is your government and you're bad and you're trying to tell us what to do. 
Well, we're government. We're not necessarily bad at all, I don't think. And we only do things with the consent of the occupier of the lands. So if we can present that, you know, and make that in all the forms and talks that we do so that people know that's how we operate here, that's probably going to ease a lot of people's minds, especially the land occupiers. All right, so that's pretty cool. And that's just on the education demonstration projects. We'll look at the next one, number three. Carry out preventive and controlled measures. Works in improvement for conservation of renewable natural resources within the district, including, but not limited to. And it goes on to talk about engineering, methods of cultivation, growing vegetation, changes of use of land, measures listed, you know, in the, in the uh, law. On, you ready for this? Emphasis, positive mm -hmm. emphasis. <laughs> on any lands within the district, what do you think the next statement is? With their permission. All right. <laughs> yeah. Upon obtaining the consent of the occupier, such <laughs> lands and such necessary rights and interests in the lands as may be required. Mm -hmm. So there you go. And it shows up over and over and over again in the power of the authority. So this would, it's, it, it just behooves us, right, to mention that, to press back on that. This one's golden. Mm -hmm. This one gets at your question, right? So we can actually actually enter into agreements, furnish financial or other aid to any agency, right? any agency, governmental or otherwise, or any occupier of lands within the district. Okay, so now here's your quiz, right? You ready? Name an audience that's not included here. Any agency, governmental or otherwise. Yeah. It's pretty broad. Yeah. This occupier could be an apartment dweller. It doesn't have to be yeah. a landowner, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I tell you, it just blows your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, the way they wrote this in the 1930s to include the opportunity for the district to enter into agreement with everybody, yeah. basically. <laughs> Friends, mm -hmm. Ducks Unlimited, Quails, you know, mm -hmm. you know, Pheasants Forever, Quail Unlimited. Audubon, Major Conservancy, Friends of the Whippy Cushion, mm -hmm. you know, the Palouse mm -hmm. Fairwater Environmental Institute. Mm -hmm. The list goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just, you just, it's endless, right? Mm -hmm. So the answer to your question is, yeah, all of that and more. Mm -hmm. So it could be private, it could be public, it could be agencies, it could be agencies of any part of the organization, it could be any of that. Now, the choice of the district board and the, and the district director is often do we want to do business with Because mm -hmm. <laughs> there's always that, right? Mm -hmm. You can do business with somebody that probably wouldn't reflect well, or the optics wouldn't be right. But for the most part, mm -hmm. you know, we're on it. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, it looked like you had a question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. okay. I'd say this is where the foundation of how we can enter an agreement to provide financial services to an occupier of the land comes in, right. and our whole foundation of cost sharing mm -hmm. for conservation practices is yeah. really awesome. Well, you're right, Jennifer. This is really the basis for cost sharing, mm -hmm. so that we can do that. And if you read a little bit farther into this, it, it says, subject to the conditions as the supervisors mm -hmm. may deem necessary to advance the purposes of the chapter. Mm -hmm. So it puts our government entity, our supervisors, our five supervisors like Cheryl, mm -hmm. in the driver's seat to determine that. So mm -hmm. we had X amount of dollars land here in our district, you know, several hundred thousand dollars, and we wanted to run our own cost share program. Guess what? We could. Mm -hmm. And we could say we're gonna we're gonna fund 100% of this or only 50% of that. We're gonna do this or that. We're only gonna put it in this part of the district. We could do any of those. The conditions are set by the supervisors themselves. Again, probably authorities that I've not seen in my career in 40 odd years really really you know delved into and used because we've never had the resources. We've never had the available resources without having to go to grants and, and you know play by their rules and whatnot. But if we had money. That we didn't have to play by Grant's rules, you know, or the Grant Turner's rules, and it, it really opens it up. All right, this one's kind of fun. This one I usually talk about that NAPA Resource Conservation mm -hmm. District, though I already have, so there we are. But you can obtain options upon or acquire in any manner except by condemnation. Again, can you feel where the legislature's head was? Mm -hmm. You only do things with the consent of the land occupier. You're not going to do condemnation of lands, right? But you can have purchase, exchange, leave, gift, request, devise, or otherwise any property or real or personal or rights or interest therein. To maintain, administer, and improve the properties acquired, to receive income from those properties, and to end such income and carrying out the purposes of this chapter. So, here we go. <laughs> Fee title, 
Ledgewood Farms wants to bring over their whole ranch to you? Law says you can. Hey, their attorney's not going to know that. Their estate's not going to know that. Their family's not going to know that. Nobody's going to know that unless you become the experts. So the six of you get you become the experts. I mean, not experts in law or experts in accounting, but certainly experts in how you can give something to the local conservation district, right, and still receive the same tax benefits as if you'd given it to a private foundation. Again, one of the authorities in 40 years, I have to admit, I'm not seeing other than just these few examples I've given in Napa, and there's a few times when we get a district, you know, a building, right, a little bit of property in a building. Rarely do we get whole farms, but sometimes it happens. Right? I have my eye on one. You are one. <laughs> no, I have my eye on one. I love, I have a, a place that is a working farm in city limits that I think would be wonderful if we could work with that family to get a conservation easement, do demonstration stuff, yeah. and have our office. Yeah. And, yeah. I Rights or interests thereof. So they could keep like the, they could keep the yeah. title. Mm -hmm. That's fine. They just allow us to have the rest, mm -hmm. right? So Napa. That would be great. Napa-like, but no wine. Or, <laughs> or grapes. <laughs> I don't know. No. Hey, Tim Danaher and his crew are making great whiskey hey, out of I wheat and oats and barley, right? That's just <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what's the reason whiskey distillery? Right? Oh, okay. You've got a distillery. <laughs> you know, and you've got a person. Yeah, that is completely So, just to drive home the point. It's sustainably <laughs> awesome. Yeah, for conservation. I love it. I'm going to blow your mind. You ready for this? Tim Danaher mm -hmm. was a district supervisor at one time in oh. the Police Conservation District. Just a thought. Just a thought. So the packaging of these authorities, right, and the endless amounts of opportunity that present itself, uh, we rarely, and, and Cheryl, this is part of your job from this point forward, we ought to take 10 minutes and just kind of innovate at every conservation district meeting. We ought to just innovate about what law we're not using, what authority we're not using yet, and how we might use it. And I think district that will do that, a district that would do that, would really, really have some fun. Not only would you be doing good conservation work, but you would just be innovative in the way that you, the way that you work the authorities that are already in your law. These things are law. They're in the state law that form the conservation district. So you don't have to make this stuff up. You don't have to go beg for forgiveness or, or, or you know, for authority. You just go do it, right? It's kind of fun. It'll knock off the socks off some people. I think that was pretty important. Here we go. Make available machinery equipment for lighter seed seedlings and material. Um, and again, it talks about seed seedlings and that sort of thing. And it talks about, you know, how it shall prescribe, you know, those things. You can make it. So, we have a big chunk of money. Uh, big Blue wants to come in and say that we want trees across the Palouse. And, hey, they drop in a, a mill a year or something like that. We, we can run that program. That sounds good. We can run that program. And we can make it available. We don't even have to charge those producers. We can put those plants where they want them, how they want them, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Not even do that. I tend to like cost here because I think it's important that the, the occupier of the lands gets a little something, something, you know, invested in it too, right, rather than just giving it to them. Mm -hmm. Because then it becomes your problem, you know, to deal with if anything goes wrong. Mm -hmm. So the plants can end up in the wrong place. That's really All right. I like this one. It's uh, prepare and keep current a comprehensive long-range plan. You're right in the middle of working on that right now. You have an annual work plan that you just finished and filed with the commission. You can have public hearings, plans developed by each district shall have an official status. Number seven in this uh, lineup goes into quite a bit of detail about what it should talk about. You know, outdoor recreation, potable water supplies, urban and rural areas, water for agriculture, memory and flow, industrial uses, <sighs> watershed stabilization, control of soil erosion, the retardation of water runoff, flood prevention control, reservoirs, water. Oh my gosh. When you look at that, it is extensive what the folks within this uh, law that formed it wanted you to work on as a conservation district. Just completely extensive, and, and, and it goes on for a few pages and it tells you what it is that we want to do. All right, so here's the deal. The, the legislature just invited us to put together a report of, of what the needs were, conservation needs are across the state. Just did that. The challenge for us all in, in the Conservation Commission and District's family is to do that by October. Put together this, this necessary report, or at least a, a pretty good report of what the conservation needs are across our state. Wow, mm -hmm. Kaylin. I mean, think San Juan Islands mm -hmm. to Pullman, mm -hmm. to Republic, to Yakima. Wow, this is going to be big. You know where we're going to go first for that? Long-range plans of the districts. Mm -hmm. 
And at no time during the careers I've had that we've had such an important assignment, right, that would depend upon how well those are written mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how important it is to write a good long-range mm -hmm. plan and a good long-range program. Complete with data, complete with where we're at, what we need, that sort of thing. You have a, a governor right now that said the other day in a, in a forum of, of agency heads, do we know how much topsoil there is left in Washington State? And they all kind of looked at him and said, well, we've got the NRCS's soil survey. He said, no, no, no. I mean, I want to know, I, I would like to know how much topsoil we have in the state where we're going to need to protect it. Now, Governor Inslee, you know, owned a farm. He and his wife actually owned a farm. So this is not surprising that Governor Inslee would have interest in, you know, what's going on with the topsoil in the state of Washington and how, what we're going to do to make sure it's retained and kept productive. Ah. So I kind of think the two kind of go hand in hand. I think there was the governor's interest, now I think there's legislator interest, mm -hmm. there's going to be interest. How well we can produce, right, these reports and this knowledge and that sort of thing, we, we, I think I've already convinced you we've got a pretty good law here, right, for authorities and that. How we use it, I think, is very important in the future. How am I doing so far, all right? All right, so here's eight. You can, oh, yeah. <laughs> emphasis on that right there. <laughs> Any. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So we can administer any project or program concerned with the conservation of renewable natural resources located within its boundaries. Okay? That's important. Undertaken by any. Okay, well, let's get back to yours. Is it? Yeah. Garrett. Garrett, this gets back to your question. To administer any project or program concerned with conservation of renewable natural resources located within its boundaries undertaken by the federal, state, or other public agency, by entering into a contract or other appropriate administrative arrangement with the agency administering such a project or program. Agency A decides it wants to turn over program B to this conservation district, they can do that. Or project. They want you to do a project for the state of Washington. They want you to do a project for the federal government. They want you to do a project, you know, for the local, uh, you know, county or, or city. You can do that. So right in your law, you can do that. Now, again, the six of you have to be the relative experts in this because not everybody, not every agency or organization is going to know this, right? They're not going to know that you can do this. They think you're pretty cool. They think you're pretty good, but they don't know that you can take on any project or program, you know, on their behalf and run it for them. Holy moly. That's a big word. Any. <laughs> any. Any. I always tease the amazing. NRCS people that are in there. Say, <laughs> you don't like that environmental quality program and center program anymore? Hey, just pitch it over to us. We'll take care of it for you. We'll make that sing like you've never had it work before. I mean, you're concerned about not having enough people. You're concerned about not having enough resources. Hey, we got people. We got resources. And we got good, you know, uh, governing bodies, good Governing boards that can really handle it. So there it is. Isn't that fun? That's why it's your favorite? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yes. mine too. And that sounds pretty cool too because it says we enter uh, joint agreements with other conservation districts in our area. And indeed, we have. Now, this district has been a shining example of how the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, where you've entered interlocal agreements not only with our neighboring conservation districts here in the Whitman County, Spokane County, Lincoln County area, but also uh, you've got uh, Layton. And this first also? Not this first. Layton. Layton, Idaho. Mm -hmm. So we can do that. Even across mm -hmm. county, uh, county and state boundaries. So you can enter in agreements. This is very important for shared resources. Because mm -hmm. as we look at RCPP maybe melting away, you know, the resources we build here in the Palouse District could be used, you know, with other districts, mm -hmm. you know, around you. So you can be the hub or the center of a, mm -hmm. a nice set of technical expertise, you know, that's available throughout the southeastern mm -hmm. area. <laughs> Now, if 8 is your favorite, 10 ought to really be your favorite, too, because 10 is to accept donations, gifts, and contributions of money, services, materials, and otherwise from the United States or any of its agencies, or the state of Washington and any of its agencies, and from any other source. Let me repeat that for, for emphasis. Or from any other source. Now, words are words, but in a law, you know, 1939 law, this is pretty cool. Any other source, and the user expends such money, services, materials, and/or contributions, as you were speaking about earlier, to carry out the purposes of this chapter. Mm -hmm. 
so again, the, probably the limitation then would, that would be upon us, right, would be to make sure we don't break the law. You know, we, we wouldn't go out and resell that or start to bring in lands and resell it. I actually had a district one time that, that brought uh, a state surplus and then started selling it uh, to, on the open market, and that, that wasn't a really good thing. We had to go back and, and undo all of that. But, <laughs> That was in the 70s. I think the statute of limitations was run out. But anyway, um, that was kind of a kind of a bad day <laughs> when we did that. So you can receive those funds, though, and the equipment and materials and all that sort of thing. So very important. Well, this one is do, does describe some of the things that can happen. We can sue, or we can be sued as a conservation district. Important that we have powers to be able to bring suit upon someone that may, you know, uh, walk off a job or not get a job done for us and that sort of thing. So this uh, sets up at least the legal structure for what can be done, which is different than most government entities. Mm -hmm. The point I need to make here is that you don't find this in, in statute in other government entities. But we can sue and we can be sued, you know, if, if need be. All right? All right, district's joint activities, administering any project or program. This is uh, when any two or more districts may engage in joint activities by agreement among them, planning, financing, constructing, operating, maintaining, or administering any, again, any program or project. Concern with the conservation and renewable natural resources. The district's concern may make available purposes uh, of the agreement for funds, property, personnel, equipment, or services available. And so this is very important, especially as you look at, you know, being able to extend some of our good technical services and whatnot out across, uh, you know, eastern Washington. So share and share alike, but share with an agreement. Do that. We also, if we're going to do business in another district with a cooperator in another district, then use it. We've got a system in place for how we approve that both boards that that can occur. It's just sometimes we have property owners that have lands in two different districts, or maybe even three different districts. And Who's going to help them with their conservation planning and the implementation of this? Okay. All right. Keep the general public agencies, occupiers, and lands informed of the works and activities of the conservation district is the next item. And then finally, designate an area, state, national association of conservation districts to coordinate entity. Now, here's a tip. Here's a pretty big, important tip. Um, when you see the word association, that's a tip to you that it's a non-government, non-profit, non, um, non, non-governmental entity. Mm -hmm. And so all that I've been talking about so far has been government, right? The state conservation dis district's law, the Conservation Commission is a real agency. But I want you to cue into this. When we talk about a Washington Association of Conservation Districts, WACD, that's not government. NACD, National Association of Conservation Districts, not government. Your Southeast Association, you know where that's coming from? Association, not government. And that's pretty important to make that distinction because the importance of the distinction is that this is the arm of us that can go out and lobby. They actually hire lobbyists. They get involved in the state legislation. They go up and they talk with the legislators about things. Uh, the conservation district supervisors can do the same. Yeah. yeah, you can do the same, but you have to, you get to file, if you do a certain amount of hours, you get to file a little paperwork that says that you did this amount of lobbying up down the hill. But through your state association and through the uh, lobbyists that they hire, uh, that, that you have, uh, you know, a good structure here of government and non-government, non-profit organizations that can really, you know, do a lot to influence things. They have three jobs. One is to influence decision-making. Second is to provide information back and forth between the districts, the member districts. Uh, and then the third is to have products and services you couldn't get anywhere else. And one of those things they've got, along with their outstanding annual meetings and events, is a plant material center. They have a plant material center where they grow conservation plants in Bow, Washington. Bow? Yeah. yeah. Thick, thick Mount Vernon. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Burlington Mount Vernon. Bow is right next to it, so Bow Hill. And the reason why I know that is my wife grew up in that area, so you know, it's part of our nature to you know what Better goes on in concrete. Skagit County. Yeah, concrete, <laughs> yeah, concrete's up there in Skagit County too. Pretty cool names. Okay, pause to reflect now. What questions do you have for me? Since we covered this one, I'm not things here. Powers, duties, Did you write down some?
questions that I need to answer? Got to those yet? Got it. Okay. You're so, you're so thorough that you're answering them as you go along. Yeah. That's the way it's supposed ahead, to work. You're answering yeah. them in your presentation. Cheryl, did you have a question or two that I don't have to yet? Well, who, uh, you know, I think I know, but who are, like, the Board of Supervisors, uh -huh. who are our constituents? Yeah. Yeah. I, my answer for that, you're certainly the electeds, the people that elected you. Now, in your case, you were appointed. Mm -hmm. So your constituents are landowners plus the citizens of the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. Because that state commission is statewide, and they appointed you to this position. So you're actually representing even a broader interest mm -hmm. than the three that were elected to their post. So we always have three board members, supervisors, that are elected, one on each of three consecutive years. So every year we've got one coming up, you know, for term, and then they're elected. Now their constituents, I would say, would be those people that elected them, that seated them in that place, and, and all of those folks in the local community that could elect them and that sort of thing. But I think the five really share the constituent base here, land occupiers. That's a big term, isn't it? So if we stretch that and say landowners, that wouldn't be fair to the rest of the people that don't own land, but manage the land. Mm -hmm. You know, we have large farms that right, they don't own property necessarily, but they farm a lot of land. And they do it for absentee landowners and that sort of thing. So we got absentee landowners, we have crypt landowners that are still in place, we have operators, and we have we have occupiers of land. Mm -hmm. So even the folks that come and enjoy the Palouse and pheasant hunt or ride their canoe or do something else like that, that they're all important to us. Mm -hmm. You know, the folks that come to go to school here at our great university, go coos, you know, mm -hmm. that's that's pretty important. Mm -hmm. And that's our constituency. Whether we whether we want to claim them all the time or not, they do some pretty crazy things. But you know, the bottom line is, you know, they live, they're our constituents to a certain extent too. Now, the fine line of all this is kind of interesting because you ask a question that we don't talk about much. In the early days of conservation districts formation, it only took 25 landowners and they set the boundaries. And in the early days, none of the municipalities or cities were, were part of a conservation district. The Secretary of State just kind of drew a line around any of the municipalities or cities, the way they were at the time, if you're understanding what I'm saying here. So you've got a constituents base, right, of landowners and land occupiers of everything but the cities and counties for a lot of years. And then the cities and counties, excuse me, the cities and municipalities, the counties have always been wrong. But the, the municipalities and cities could decide to be a part of their conservation district. They could actually resolve to do that. So a resolution by the city or, or uh, municipality and the conservation district sent to the Secretary of State and they're in. So we have a ton of cities and, and municipalities that are in our conservation districts now. So the constituent base, the reason I'm getting around to this, is the constituent base depends. And it's, remember, yeah. last night, 45 independent you know, <laughs> folks that are doing it their way. Well, hey, in Okanagan, they may have, you know, all of the cities. Mm -hmm and, and uh, go a district down the road, and they may not have gotten any of their cities or municipalities in. So their constituent base then is made up of who can vote them in the, you know, their positions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Land occupiers and elected officials, you know, and, uh, uh, people that can uh, register and, and be a part of the election process. Mm -hmm. I like that language on your first slide um, yeah. of land users. Land users. And I, yeah. I jotted that down because mm -hmm. we're always looking for the right terminology in our outreach and our materials mm -hmm. and what to put on there. Mm -hmm. So it's not just limited to landowners, mm -hmm. but land users, I think, is a great, all encompassing. It really does because, of, uh, you know, someone comes to visit you, you know, and you want to take them out and uh, do whatever, huh? recreate, do whatever, then, uh, yeah, they're part of our base too. And in Colorado, that's huge, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a lot ton of, of stakeholder interests. In yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and have student landowners too, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly from the discussion center. Anyway, you had a question. Um, we were talking about like directors and stuff. Where does the power in each conservation district lie? Does ah. it lie with the director or the board? The board. And the board, how do they get appointed? They're voted in by? Three are elected by the local citizenry. Uh, of the county or the conservation district? Of the conservation district. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just the same rules apply that I was just telling you. You know, if, if they do have municipalities and cities in, they, mm -hmm. they get the vote too. If they're not in, they don't get the vote. Yeah. It's just the 
the registered voters in the conservation district themselves. And then the board has to sign off on all decisions within the conservation district, including hiring decisions? So the board, the boards each can delegate to a director or a manager mm -hmm. certain mm -hmm. authorities. And so again, rugged individualism yeah. 45, there's 45 different answers to that same question. Okay. But for the most part, you'll find that uh, in the larger conservation districts like ours, that a board will take care of the governance, the policy development, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, the direction, mm -hmm. and then the delegation of authority to this position here, the director. And the director then has the authority to hire, fire, do that sort of thing, evaluate, okay. uh, make decisions on certain budget items up to a certain extent, things like that. And uh, but each of the boards have found their place of their governance role and where that resides, and then this delegated authority to their director, mm -hmm. and then the delegated authorities to each staff. Mm -hmm. It's uh, relatively simple when there's only one person, like our neighboring district, right? You got the governing board and you got Brian, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's it. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a relatively simple process. And it, you know, uh, the board hires and evaluates Brian, and that's it. Brian doesn't have anybody else under him, and there is no delegated structure or organizational structure. Here it is, it is a lot more complicated now. How does, so you said the board gets elected by like county elections? And three, like three of the board members are elected by local citizenry, right? Uh -huh. the registered voters in, in the district. Two are appointed by the state commission, okay. the organization mm -hmm. agency I work for. Mm -hmm. And Cheryl is one of those. That's mm -hmm. why I was talking about that about a little bit earlier. How do the elections in like citizenry, like county level work? Is that just on like the ballot? Or it's a special election, or is it not on the ballot, but it's a special election where uh, nominations are taken and received, and then uh, ballots are produced. Uh, the date of the election is is uh, is set by the local mm -hmm. conservation district. They run that special election, right? Mm -hmm. And so they run a special election with an election box, an election ballot, the old-fashioned way, yeah. just like we have. We do have a few districts that run electronic elections where they all registered voters in the district can vote through an electronic means mm -hmm. in some of our larger districts. Mm -hmm. But the district is actually responsible for overseeing the election process for the mm -hmm. supervisors. Is the turnout pretty good with that or do you have to like really push that yes. out there? Year to year, I mean we've had as uh, little as no votes to <laughs> maybe a hundred votes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, like a hundred votes would be a big year. Yeah. In the Whatcom County, to contrast that, they'll have 15 to 20,000 people. Mm -hmm. So it varies. Again, the rugged individualism of 45 different districts doing their uh -huh. own thing, right, Well, is the answer to the question, which is really confusing, right? Because it should be really standard. It should be this and that. Mm -hmm. The district's going to meet August 20th and 21st, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're going to talk about this because there's been some criticism that there hasn't been enough exposure or uh, to our voting special election process. And so they're going to talk, they're going to get together, we do these every once in a while, all district meeting, mm -hmm. where we bring everybody that will come, supervisors like mm -hmm. Cheryl and directors, you know, like Jennifer, to one spot and we talk about things like this that we need to consider maybe on a statewide basis. Is it time to go to a general ballot? Is it time to maybe move to a one week, uh, you know, open poll where you start on Monday morning at 8 and you end at Friday at 5 and all 45 districts do their vote do their elections at the same time so we can promote it and so that we can talk about conservation during that week and talk about the conservation districts and get a little exposure that we've not gotten. You know, it, the bigs would still be able to have several thousand people and, and everybody else we hope would, you know, at least have a few hundred, you know, people come in and vote. But opening up the polls at a certain time and ending at a certain time, right now the law says we can do anything from January to March, any date, and the district gets to pick it. So. Yeah, thanks for the question. That was a great question. Do you have a question for me too? Yeah, yeah okay. so kind of like, um, like how do you, what's the process of starting a new district and then like how does that district get their board? Or sure. I guess? Sure, the law is pretty clear on how you start a new district. It is still 25 signatures by uh, landowners within that district boundaries to form their own district. Um, I don't know that the Secretary of State would be, you know, open to that now because we're covered all but just a little bit of white area out in southwestern Washington. So we're covered pretty much already with the conservation district. So um, that would be kind of a weird thing that 25 mm -hmm. landowners would come in and say we want to form our own district, but they could. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, it's, it's a law that could, but, but it would conflict against the existing boundaries of conservation measures. But then it needs state approval? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Come before the state commission and then finally go before the secretary of uh, the state. Secretary? Uh, might not the right term while it's here. Secretary of State, yeah. Mm -hmm. Secretary of State really is the one that we pile all the boundaries with and all of all of the formation and even changes of names go to the Secretary mm -hmm. of State from the mm -hmm. State Conservation Commission. Mm -hmm. So they can approve those. That's an interesting question. I haven't thought about that. But yeah, we really uh, they're not gonna get any additional money. We've already put that in the in the in some of the rules that we've got. Uh, just a form to get extra money. We don't think that's probably mm -hmm. Have other questions for me? Okay, I gotta check your energy level and check the time because I promised we wouldn't go past two hours, right? <laughs> so an hour and a half, two hours, and I bet you've got time. So how are we doing on time? Okay, should I cover it a little bit more? Should I put on my dancing shoes and really get fast <laughs> with this? This is the important things I wanted to get across to you today duties and authorities, that history and the basic structure. But really when it comes down to it, you know, it's, it's big. It's every conservation district, all 45, can decide what their program would look like. What kind of resource issues that they have in their district, what kind of needs they have within their district, and can actually form the program to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just incredible. Again, I want to just go out to the San Juan Islands, often actually, go to, yeah, go out to Orcas and, and study what they've got. They've got small farms, they've got real erosion problems, they've got real water problems, they've got real everything, just like everyone else, except that the way that they go about business on the island community might be different than the way we would do business out here in the Palouse. But everyone can be different. And there's some basic principles that we really adhere to, and, and first and foremost, that we think that the citizenry has to be involved in their conservation efforts. You know, they have to make the decisions on their farm ranches, small acreages and whatnot to actually do conservation. That's the long lasting stuff. That's when we really get a lot done and the, and the conservation really stays there, you know, on the landscape. And if the the significance of, of making sure that we're paying attention to that, you know, that that person that bought that land for a certain interest, you know, is actually taken care of. You know, whether it be an economic interest, whether it be an aesthetic interest, whether it be this or that or the other, whether they want to put easements on it, that's all their decisions. So we pay particular attention to that. Supervisors role and responsibility. So one is uh, first and foremost, uh, Cheryl, here we go. One is to establish a vision and policy, set the overall direction for the resource needs and the program needs to address those issues within the, within the district. Delegate authorities, you set the policy, staff implements the policies. Um, Mary has been very heavily involved in, in re-looking at all of our policies. and. Uh, and Jennifer, and they've been doing a yeoman's job looking at every, every right. digging under every every piece of policy we've got to make sure that they're going to be proper. All right? The second really important thing for a supervisor to do is to hold people accountable. So this is where they hold the, in, in this case, the, the supervisors hold Jennifer accountable, Jennifer holds the staff accountable to get things done. And overall, you asked me about the structure. If I put one over the board members, the board supervisors, it's that constituency out there. It's the landowners and the people out there that are counting on us to do good conservation work. And if I really want to extend that, I'd say the next generations. Mm -hmm. My grandkids, their grandkids, after them, you know, seven generations out, each generation is going to be better because you were here working and doing what it is that you set out to do. That puts us on a little higher plane, I think, than just a board member of any other organization or just a staff member of any other organization. We have long-term, you know, effects of the work we do for these. Sorry. Um, can, because you said the general public like generally has mm -hmm. the last say, can they vote out a board member uh, or I guess like an employee for a conservation district? Not an can employee. they put enough pressure on the director or the board to be like, this person really isn't working? <laughs> or <laughs> Okay, well, I'll answer that not, question. It'll, it'll go through a I series just, of steps, right? If mm -hmm. there's a complaint by a landowner, it'll be investigated by by the staff, usually, by the staff, uh, the director, would investigate that and see whether or not there was value to it. If there was enough value to it, she'll write that up, she'll t cut it, get the facts, mm -hmm. and she'll take that to a board member, you know, or to a, a, the chair, and the chair, and she will decide whether or not it'll go before the board or not. So there's a series of steps. Yeah. The first part would be just to find out and investigate whether or not it's a valid complaint. If it's and a valid complaint, there's a series of steps in our policy that yeah. we go through. But 
uh, our board members, once they're elected, up for re-election the yes. next year? Yes. So they can be voted out? Three years out. Each or three-year three three term. Years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your elected officials, right, there's the three-year term, mm -hmm. and that's how you stagger the election. So there's always one election happening, you know, each year. Mm -hmm. And so somebody will be finishing a term, you know, and they'll be re-elected or elected out. So yes, they can be elected out. There's a, a write-in system. Mm -hmm. There is the, the actual election. There is the, you know, nobody runs, you know, or somebody quits the midterm, and we can fill those uh, positions with, with um, oftentimes it's, for the three elected positions, it's the board members that would place somebody in that um, unexpired term. For appointed positions, it would be the state commission that would still take that responsibility of putting someone in there. And Cheryl went up to our website and applied for, you know, consideration as an appointed supervisor. Conservation history. Mm -hmm. yeah. These are great questions. Okay, work directly with decision makers. One of the really cool things about being a conservation history supervisor in Love Cheryl is that we expect that, and, and we know that she'll be working you know, with decision makers, the elected officials, you know, our own Mary Dye and, and Joe Schmack and Senator Mark. A couple of them were on a tour the other day with us, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we expect that our supervisors would be, know them very well and talk with them about the needs. But, also, any of our local, state, federal, municipal, you know, city governments, any of that, Dean, Dean Kinzer was on the, the tour with us the other day. This is where we believe that the supervisor role here, working directly with those folks, you know, they are an elected or appointed official to this board. So working with these other electeds, right, is a pretty important piece of what they do. So, uh, when does it become lobby? <laughs> if you were, if you were out uh, as a conservation district, conservation district supports the pack for uh -huh. Mark Sessler. Well, mm -hmm. right. we would do that. Yeah. Or the conservation district would pitch ten thousand dollars towards the, you know, the pack that Senator Sessler has. Right. Right. So we're under the guys of the pack. You, yeah. you are. Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you so much. That's the easier. Yeah. That's the reason. But well, we can inform them of yeah. um, district needs, conservation yep. needs, yep. inform them of our programs, and, you know. Yep, um, thank them for their support, for mm -hmm. crying out loud, you know, for helping us. Uh, Joel mm -hmm. went in for yes. an increase exactly. in our, uh, our basic implementation money, you know, this year, and, mm -hmm. and it wasn't successful, but he did that, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's pretty fabulous given the experience we had with it earlier in the year, right? We didn't, <laughs> and it's really, really great, mm -hmm. so. All right, so district supervisors, just to drive home this point. Now, these are your board members. Uh, they are public officials. Uh, they shall determine the, the, the staff duties and compensation. Sometimes they will delegate that to the director, mm -hmm. and in this case, in the police district they have, they can delegate that authority then. They provide records in all their proceedings, annual audit, serve without compensation. It's right in the law, serve without compensation, but we do get reimbursed for travel. Uh, you don't levy taxes or bonds. Right in the law, also, and you shall remain ultimately responsible for the district. So, the supervisor dues and notes three years, 12 regular scheduled meetings, committee and special meetings, WACD area and state meetings. Huh, this is a low average. We know that, that most of the supervisors, you know, 20 days is kind of the start of what they actually would do, you know, in service for their conservation district. But we hope that these are the things that they really get from, you know, that's, that's personal satisfaction working in this arena critical input, unique opportunity to make a real difference for generations to come. We think it's pretty important. So employees, all right? Orientations like today would be an important part of what we would do. Uh, for all new employees, job descriptions would be clearly written so you would know exactly what you're expected to do and clearly understood the district employees and, and other personnel. So you would all know, you know what each other is doing. Those job descriptions would be easy to find and use. Performance reviews for employees should be done regularly very important part of what we would do. And uh, district officials must set the overall direction for the district employees. This is why we're going over the policy book and working on that. But they won't be on the day-to-day. -day. You won't see Cheryl here on a day-to-day -day basis telling you what to do. It's going to be Jennifer that does that. And Jennifer and, and our program managers, right, mm -hmm. would be doing that all right, in our district. All the administration employees are responsible of the Conservation District Board, ultimately. Mm -hmm. But they've delegated quite a bit in this district to Jennifer. So you can just consider Jennifer pretty much, pretty much yet below Jennifer's uh, level. And one district supervisor is typically our primary liaison between the board and district employees. That's a contact supervisor. 
been uh, really pleased. Chris, Her uh, Chris Heisterman has served in that capacity in our district for several years, and that got turned over last night to Shiloh Spice. Spice. Shiloh's going to be taking over that. We had an election of officers last night in our conservation district. So. Okay, your role is to understand the district's uh, mission, provide that link between the cooperator, you know, and the work that we do and the board, and be a source of technical knowledge, and work with the NRCS and other agencies in implementing the, the conservation measures, and this is really okay. After 40 years of being in the career, I found out that it's really okay to say, I don't know, I'm gonna find out for you, or I wanna get you the best answer I can get you. You know, so I'm gonna come back with an answer. You know, you're out there in a landowner's place and you really don't know, that this program, that program would be applicable, or this program, that program rule. It may not even be our program, right? And you'll just need to just say, I'm going to get back to you soon. Now, the back side of that is to make sure you get back to me. That's the important thing. The follow up is important. All right, know the chain of command, and, and we've spent a little time on that. Is it clear today that it was in the email? Yeah. Board, constituents, board, <laughs> Jennifer, <laughs> program managers. I know Cheryl, uh, Jennifer offered to go over that, uh, that organizational chart with you too at some point in time, so we can sure do that. So know that chain of command is important. Always be looking for that next project, that next opportunity. Now that you know the authorities and the law, it's kind of like, huh, I wonder if we could use it for that. Uh, cooperative relationships means everything. Uh, this district has had really good cooperative relationships, and we've had a few sour grapes over the years, and then we've had really good cooperative relationships again. Kind of went up and down like a roller coaster, but uh, I think we're in a much better spot than we've been in a lot of years. Be ethical about all the things that we do. Right? All right, review our mutual agreement, cooperative working agreement. This is kind of a fun agreement. Um, you actually have an agreement with the USDA Secretary of Agriculture. It's called a mutual agreement. And so the Secretary of Agriculture, the Governor of the State of Washington, and the Chair of your local conservation district signed an agreement to do conservation work together. So all USDA agencies, and all the state agencies and the highest point of our local conservation district delivery signed that mutual mm -hmm. agreement. It's only two pages big, and I would encourage us to get that out, take a look at it in one of our meetings. It's a really quick, easy read, but it's really powerful. I mean, my goodness, can you think of that? All of USDA, all of the you know Washington State's agencies and, and our local district signed an agreement to do conservation work. Uh, our technical work should meet or exceed our district adopted specifications. In most cases, this is this is the Natural Resource Conservation Service that's given us our standards and specifications. So you hear us talk a lot about you know use the NRCS standards and specs, use it, and that gives us a good rubric right to work from. You can work above that if you want to, but at least that gives a base rubric that we know is that science based right and out there and in, in, in the in the. Uh, in our fields and in our pastures and in our forests, you know, we know that it's work. Mm -hmm. So, good place to go. Now, uh, a second part of this is that we do have access to a conservation district engineer that we share with other districts in the area. And Gary Osmond's our district engineer, mm -hmm. uh, professional engineer, has his professional license, and he can sign off on specifications that maybe aren't in in the um, uh, handbook or in the standards and specifications of NRCS. And last night, uh, we took about five minutes, I think we went over some of that, right? Gary's been working with us on some stream uh, stream systems, right? And some stream protection systems. All right, keeping our red and my attitude, issues come up, individuals involved should be encouraged to talk with one another, try to talk it out first. It's part of your policy of your district to do that first, and then work it up the chain of command if you need to. Uh, all right, all right. Yeah. Should I use all five minutes? Sure, go for it. All right, here we go. All right, district candidates should provide that local leadership, right? And you should be listening to constituents, bringing that back in the office, you know, talking about what we should do. And I think that, you know, we should be, you know, using that to eventually interest the parties, not just the ones we like. And tug in cheek, but it, it actually does happen. But uh, we don't want just our district to just deal with the folks that we like. We, we're out here for resource base. All right, and uh, this, uh, this is a graphic I'm probably going to have, but the planning is really the key to a lot of the things we do. And the first start is with the resource users. We've mentioned that, and I think we've driven that point home today a lot, and their resource needs. So that, that becomes the basis for what we build this on. 
I really like three questions uh, for technicians to use when they're out in the field. One of them is, what do you already do it for conservation? You know, have the person take you out and show you. Second is, what is it that you want to do next for conservation? And third, how can our conservation district help you do what it is the next thing you want to do or keep on doing what it is you've been doing? So what conservation work have you already done? What's the next project in conservation you want to do? How can we help? And those three questions, I think, would become the basis for really building a, a, you know, a really good plan. But it's going to also represent some of the federal law things, state law things, or local ordinances, available resources. And the plan can actually be built around first the resource users and resource needs of that user, but, but also take into account these uh, federal and state laws that are out there. Because ultimately, that resource user doesn't want to have to come back into a plan that doesn't represent you know, the things that need to be done on their place to make them you know, compliant with, with everything you need. So you build a district program, so you do enough of these. One of the examples I have in our very local conservation districts, they only have about 90 real live agriculture producers. I mean, these are producers that get up every morning, and that's all they do. They don't have other jobs. They just do farming and ranching. They're down to about 90 of those. And so they're building long-range plans with each of those 90 so that they can actually build this program based on what the 90 producers say they really need from their conservation district. So if it's 12 manure handling systems, right, if it's this many irrigation water management systems, if it's this many this and that, they want to know of that 90, that, that audience in particular, what that represents. And then they start stacking them in for grant applications and for funding and that sort of thing because they know it exactly. They've been that much in tune with it. Now one of the things we like about that is the Department of Ecology actually looks at that county. They come into that county just long enough to see how things are going. They go right back out again because there's nothing really to do there. Quick question. Yeah. The 90, yeah. is that ours or is that state? It's a neighboring. It's a neighboring conservation district, just as an example. Oh, an example. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was yeah. just wondering yeah. what, where the, the 90 was coming yeah. from. Yeah, it's so. down in the Southern County. Oh, okay. Yeah. All you right. Know, you've got a base of, of just this many producers that are still up in those three mm -hmm. areas okay. in the Southern County that are still farming, they're still ranching. Mm -hmm. That's their main thing that they do all the time, right? And they feel like they can put together the long term mm -hmm. plans, conservation plans with each of those, mm -hmm. and really drive a program based on that. And they're doing it. Do we have a number for here, for our district, of well, full-time? I've asked that question. It's in the hundreds. We still well, have in the hundreds. But. When, I, when I sent out the survey that I did in 2012 yeah. based on the ag service, and yeah. this was for my dissertation, not for the well, district participated as part of that, as sponsor for that, there were 1,200 primary yeah. agricultural producers yeah. in Whitman yeah. County. Yeah. Oh, wow. In um, in the, and that was the 2012 ag yeah. services um, yeah. It's still about yeah, it's about 12 yeah. Yeah. So you're big, I didn't and, you, that and uh, when you start to look at you know what would be the right size for your conservation district, that's the answer I'd give. Right. As opposed to a Minnesotan that has a you know five mm -hmm. staff person mm -hmm. uh, you know operation so and ninety some plus their small acreages. Mm -hmm. You know if right. you add up all their small acreages, they got a lot of resource issues to deal with. Pomeroy probably the same thing, mm -hmm. eighty to ninety. I think they told me seventy five to eighty. Still, mm -hmm. producers that are actually that's what they're doing all the time. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Cheryl? Is that, is that right? You would know this. Um, past positions you have. Yeah, I think yeah, it's pretty small. There's more mm -hmm. numbers in the FSA accounting than there yeah, actually is producers, producers doing it because yeah. there's still landowners yeah. that are absentee landowners yeah. that are part of the yeah. operator, yeah. Quality, you know, yeah. operator producer mix. But this is, you know, real life, get on the tractor, get out there, mm -hmm. do the work kind of operations. Right. They're becoming smaller, bigger, bigger, and smaller. Smaller. Numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so just a thought. And then you build that district program and you provide these services. That one example I've given you, I think uh, that district has about 12 natural resource investment projects all lined up. Mm -hmm. And they know which ones they're going to be working with. You know, who's next in line that's going to get a project, you know, as soon as they get the funding from multiple sources. They deal with the uh, uh, Bonneville Power, Recreation Conservation Office, the Conservation Commission, but they just kind of use a host of different funding mechanisms to actually get at that. But a much smaller example than what you've got here. Mm -hmm. You have 1,200 in the whole county. Mm -hmm. Largest wheat producing county in the nation. I would see that when you mm -hmm. go back and forth across the line of what you guys need to do. 
All right. So, what did we learn from just 120 minutes of being with <laughs> What do you think, Colin? What did you get from today? Oh, my gosh. Um, well, it really helped me see how everything fits together. Mm -hmm. And just coming from outside, you know, mm -hmm. corporate world and having nothing to do with mm -hmm. this kind of helped me break down like how everyone's related yeah. mm -hmm. and what we're really focusing on and what mm -hmm. the board does and mm -hmm. kind of just getting the pieces together. It was yeah. extremely helpful for that. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you mentioned the board too because they have a lot of responsibility, especially this one, you know, running a larger operation yeah. and that sort of thing. It's it's a huge responsibility. So and we welcome Cheryl to that to that post and we're looking forward to having her. Yeah. The Whitmores uh, finished that was the third generation of Whitmores that had served from the very start of the organization. Mm -hmm. So we, we closed out a piece of business there, yeah. which was uh, the intergenerational Whitmore clan had had started with us in the very first days of the operation of the North Blues District and then served all the way through when Mark, uh, Mark finished wow. his term. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Something you got from today, please. Um, I definitely got a better understanding of I don't know, just the process of operations and I don't know, I'm not terribly familiar with conservation districts. It's yeah. not something that they really, I think that there's more of an emphasis on them in Washington State than there was in Colorado. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, so it's just interesting, especially because I've already read the book. So hearing, or the Dust Bowl book, the worst, what was worst it? Yeah. yeah. I read that a while ago, but I loved it, and so I thought that was really interesting that that's where all of this kind of originated from, and that makes sense because everything that they've talked about in that book that were problems are things that we're still working on today, mm -hmm. and it doesn't seem like the mission has changed in the last, like, roughly 100 years mm -hmm. that conservation districts have been around. Yeah. The good thing is that we're not put in a lot of uh, these huge ditches that we had back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, you know, when mm -hmm. I first broke in, we had some mm -hmm. even more serious issues than we have now, but we still have serious issues. Garrett, so, there's going to be plenty of work for you to do, I hope you have to stay with us all the time. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah, I just got a project, so, so I'm so like, so ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> you got a blue binder. You got a blue binder. Like a blue planning binder. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Caleb, something you got from there. Um, I like how, like, Everything is dependent on the land users, like and their compliance and uh -huh. like, consent. If they don't yeah. want to do something, then it won't happen. So Isn't that I think it's cool yeah. how that's so important. I think that's a pretty nice piece of, of work, isn't mm -hmm. it? Those, mm -hmm. those 1930 lawmakers really knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they didn't want that overwhelming kind of situation where we were telling people what to do. We wanted to make sure we were welcome on those places. So, next up, we got bureaucracy. Um, really, sorry. I really took away like uh, all of the powers, like really understanding, like yeah. the fine tuning yeah. of like the powers, and like understanding, yeah. you know, the laws that were written, you yeah. know, seventy, eighty years ago. You know how they're relevant today and how they're interpreted today. They were really, really interesting. Yeah. 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 How applicable they are today. Yeah. I think that you know after forty years of working in, I think. You know, surely a 1930s law is going to be outdated, not applicable, not this and that. It's everything but that. It's really amazing how yeah. broad of the scope yeah. they had when yeah. they wrote yeah. it. Yeah, Mr. Hugh Abbott and his, his friends, they really, I, I, you know, okay, all right, here's the fourth document you want to pick up. And if you can't find it, I'll find it for you because I, I've got a copy of it. It is the interviews with Philip Glick. And Philip Glick was the guy that, that helped uh, form the model law. And what, what they do, they interviewed this Philip Glick to determine why these sections of law were put in there. Hmm. Yeah, I forgot to mention it. I don't know why I forget about it. Anyway, Philip Glick, the interviews of Philip Glick and uh, the origin of the Conservation District Law. And if you don't have that, then we can, I've got, one, I've got an electronic version of that I can send to you. So just, just okay. shoot so order a copy of each of these and put them mm -hmm. in our resource library. Oh, okay. The worst part of times is so this is a, a picture, too, of some of the different places that we can actually do work with. And this is just a, you know, certainly doesn't include even all the entities that we can do business with. Just some of the important ones. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, something you got from our short time ago. Actually, the opening statement I thought was really quite good. That function 
Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Yeah, I should end with that one because that really does say it all, doesn't it? It says that, you know, the function of the conservation is to bring together technical, financial, educational resources, whatever their shores, yep. to support them, and to use the local land user. It's pretty fun. We, we, uh, I'm going to send this slide set to you, and also there's a modules that, that are available on the Conservation Commission site if you want to dig into this a little bit deeper. One of my colleagues, Stu Treefry, who has a golden voice, he was the voice of the Cougar Marching Band for years when he was here at Washington State University anyway. So Stu narrates uh, some, of the, uh, some of the work too. You might hear a little bit different, a uh, little bit different rendition of this, but it's still a good, good place to go. And then just some of our primary partners too. But I'll send you the, if I can get everybody's email address, I would send you your, uh, uh, I think I got yours here. Yeah. So uh, I would send you just the slides. And stuff, so. so unless there's other questions, I, I five minutes after the mark here, mm -hmm. I don't want to keep you after school too bad, because <laughs> I know you've got lots of things going on. If there is another question, watch your hand. Mm -hmm. One comment while people are thinking of questions. I learn something new every time. I, I hear this from Ray. Um, still, my favorite thing about the district family, uh, including the State Conservation Commission and the districts, is that we can work on all natural resources issues that are, you know, in a voluntary way. Mm -hmm. And I think we'd be hard pressed to find another entity with that That's commission right. in charge to be able to work on anything within the realm of natural resources conservation. Uh -huh. I uh -huh. think that is so cool. With you know everything from air to land to water yeah. to weeds to uh -huh. you name it habitat, um, stormwater, in urban issues. I think that's mm -hmm. the, I think yeah, the, I agree. the biggest collateral that we have, the biggest probably piece that we have is a relationship because we have a board that's made up of, you know, folks that are elected or appointed from the local community, that local connection with the land managers and landowners. That, that's really our collateral. You know, when, when that's strong and we can offer that and we can write agreements with them and we can write agreements with various organizations and agencies to do what we just said to them. And that truly is an important part. So with that, I feel like I almost should say all rise. And <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Nice. Yeah, this pleasure awesome. to be this with you. Thank you. My pleasure. Great information. Enjoy your jobs. Enjoy your new, <laughs> new board governance role. Thank yeah. you. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have enjoyed it for 40 years. Oh, the red one, yeah.